Praise the Lord. Would you turn to Matthew chapter 26? I think there's still misunderstanding in the body of what action to take in certain instances and what the Christian attitude ought to be toward authorities and news media and whatever. So we trust we can say it once more, even if a bit repetitious at points, and uh, everyone come to a proper understanding because if 99 people understand what the right action is in scriptural and one doesn't, it's the one that the people seem to pounce upon and try to make a mountain out of a molehill or blow it all out of proportion. Matthew 26, there's a principle set forth in three passages I want to read that I want you to get first of all. Matthew 26, 57 to 63. This is at the time of Jesus' trial. First of all, they take him to Caiaphas and the high priest, later to Pilate. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none, and at last came two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? He's been silent, is the point. Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. You may feel a great obligation sometimes to speak, and sometimes it's not wisdom. Jesus said, yeah. Don't cast your pearls, remember? All right, John 19. Let's look at John 19. The same principle is set forth. There's a time to speak. He said, in another place, be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, it's just important many times, be as wise as a serpent as as harmless as a dove. John 19, 7 to 11. The Jews answered him, speaking to Pilate, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Here's Son of God, created this man. <laughs> but didn't feel any pressure, compulsion to feel they had to answer him. Then Pilate threatened. He said, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? And Jesus said, You could have no power against me at all except it were given you from above. But that isn't a defense. He's just stating a fact there. He doesn't justify himself, does not defend himself. Now let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. And here is the principle that you see acted out there at the trial and crucifixion taught. 1 Peter 2 verse 19, For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience sake toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. That's thankworthy, friends. You're hearing it? For what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. I haven't read a word yet about answering your critics or defending yourself. Did you ever try to bail the ocean out with a spoon? That's what it would be like. Common sense ought to tell us that this is a Christian principle. Verse 21, you're to take that patiently for even hereunto where you call because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. What steps? Taking it patiently, not answering your critics. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, 
When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Friends, the world doesn't understand that principle. The institutional church does not understand it. Neither the world or Christendom of our day understands it, and of course would never apply it, but we are obligated to apply that principle. You should never feel obligated to defend your position. You can't argue people into truth or into faith. As I say, it would be like bailing the ocean out with a spoon. I want to state these things tonight as the position of the church so that if you take any other position, you know you're out of harmony with the church. Now, I represent the church at this point when I stand up here. With much concern, I say the things that I say. It's not opinion or just my personal views or attitude. I sincerely believe that what I say is of the Lord because I have to answer for this. And so the principle taught all through the New Testament is don't answer your critics, don't cast your pearls before swine. Jesus said that. I'm not calling people swine. That's what he said. So your responsibility on behalf of this body, please hear me, is no comment to the news media, ever. Why won't you comment? No comment. Don't even comment on why you won't comment. Do it in a spirit of love, a sweet spirit, a Christian spirit. But the news media, dear friends, I don't have to inform you of this, reports nothing but the negative. They will compass land and sea to find a person who died and, and overlook, as I said this morning, 10,000 got healed with faith. So they can report the negative. There is never any intention, even when they tell you we'd like to present both sides. Don't you fall for that deception. How in the world could they present 10, 11 years of charismatic experience in this church in two or three columns, even if they wanted to do what's right, which they don't? No comment. Now, to authorities, yes, because we are responsible to the authorities according to the Word of God. We know that here. You answer all their questions. That is, you don't have to answer any more than is required. And you don't have to prove anything. Because, you see, you're not acting just on your behalf. You're acting on behalf of this body. And that's why it must be no comment. This is what we've instructed our office. That's what we practice in our home. I had the news on the other day when it came on. Coming up right away, they announce all the leads, you know, of what's on that news program for an hour. One of them, Glory Barn Faith Assembly. We have an editorial by those of us who are concerned about human life. We're not here. Now, what do I do with a news report like that? I don't know what you would do. I turn it off immediately. I don't feed on the negative. I practice what I preach to you. And some of you haven't learned that yet. That's why I get the phone calls and you have the questions. Is because you've never learned to turn off, tune out the negative. You should not even listen to it, not even read it. Because then you'll have a day or a week of trying to overcome all of that negative and answering it with your thoughts and justifying and, oh, if I just had that reporter here, would I tell him? Why read it? Because it is always negative, no exception. Even when they would attempt to report it correctly, there's no way to report the faith message correctly. Because if you had the faith message, you wouldn't be in that business. You wouldn't be reporting it. Now, I've got no hang-ups about or on the news media. I'll tell you, friends, uh, I've got victory over that just like everything else. But some of us need to have some victory there. There is no law. These are just human beings who need eight hours of sleep like you. And I could say some things that would be a little crude, but it's true that they have to go to the bathroom like everyone else. They're not gods. They're not authorities. They are people trying to pick your bones. No comment is the position of this church. No comment.
It is a spirit. It's the spirit of Antichrist. In the news media, the news media is what is destroying this country. I've said it before. This isn't anything new. It's nothing personal. I've said it before. Nothing ever gets reported correctly. I could write a book on the negative. News, negative expression of what's seen. That's what it stands for. N-E-W-S. And it's not news anyway. It's views. So the point is, don't be coerced. Don't be forced or pressured into making comments about what you believe. Now, it's another thing to give a witness to a person who's interested. Sometimes you'll be giving a witness to a person who isn't interested. That's just a testimony of the Lord. I've done that. But when you know that their object is not your good and your welfare and are going to report the negative to help destroy the work of the Lord in this place, and that's exactly the effect it has... No comment. You're not obligated to. Authorities, as we've already said, authorities, yes. I don't think we have to tell you that. So we must see that there is a place where we have to use a little bit of wisdom. I don't know what they're going to do about some of the things they've got all mixed up already. That's not my problem. They were over photographing the wrong Freeman house. I guess that'll... <laughs> That will go right on the air, you know, like uh, gospel truth. But it is pathetic. I don't want to dwell too long on that, but this is what I mean by the negative. Where there is nothing, then you say, now, we have no news today, but we suggest that this is possible what might happen in the upcoming election or something. Well, enough of that, dear friends. I was called and uh, I said, under no circumstances can you come and interrogate or interview or take pictures, and they did it anyway. I don't know how it happened, but I'm going to suggest that in the future that the responsible men of the church, and we ought to have enough of them here who are responsible, if you see a news car on this property or cameras, you invite them to leave. Now anyone can come who comes to worship and hear the word. That, that's understood, but, but do I have to stand up here and say we should not permit someone who comes in who does not intend to do us good? What kind of people are we that we permit such a thing to go on without saying, no, you're not welcome? They called and said, you're saying then we're not welcome? I said, not for the purpose for which you intend to come. I said, it's a public meeting, but not for a purpose for which you intend to come. Came anyway. How did they end up taking pictures? How was it some of you didn't say that you shouldn't be doing that? Or maybe some of us like to appear on television. I don't know. But in the future, I'm going to suggest that you invite them off of the property. After the reporter was here, and I don't know if he's here tonight, it doesn't matter because I'm telling it like it is. I'm not even telling it half like I could embarrass the news media. I was listening to a program here recently to interrupt my thought for a moment. And uh, it was about this whole business, and people were calling in from all over and saying, why is it that the news reports nothing but the negative? Well, he said, that's what makes news. Yes, negative expression of what's seen. And so he said after the service, and he wasn't even supposed to be here except with an open heart, not with a camera and a notepad. And I told him no on the phone, no interviews, no comments, and so on. And he came up after, he said, have you had a change of heart about what we talked about? I said, well, first, let me ask you, you sat through this whole service. And that was a tremendous service. Yeah. I, I said, have you had a change of heart on the basis of what you saw and heard? Well, he said, no. Well, I said, I haven't either. If you could sit through two hours or whatever it was of that and not have a change of heart, friends, we've got nothing else to offer you. So just leave it at no comment, but be sweet about it. Don't explain why there's no comment. That's a snare. Well, why won't you? Or why did you this or that? As if it isn't going to be reported. It'll not only be reported, it'll be reported in their context by people who value life as it was said. 
So this is what our attitude should be toward those who misquote and do not intend good for us. And now we want to look at the other side, and that is basically, I could have left all that off, except to tell you it ought to be no comment except to authorities. That's really all I'm saying at that point. That should be our attitude, no comment. Jesus' attitude, no comment. See, I read three passages where it was no comment. And there are others we could read. Now there's another side. That should be our attitude toward those who ridicule or misunderstand purposely or otherwise. But we have a responsibility not to give unnecessary cause for ridicule or misunderstanding. There is a right attitude. Sometimes we think we're exercising faith when we're not. We may be trying faith. And that isn't criticism. Because many times there's a lack of knowing what to do. Now you can't always wait six months to say what needs to be said because by that time everybody's forgotten the pressures of Channel 13 and whatever that was misquoting. Dear friends, I want to make one other statement. If the news media had to prove just 10% of what they say every hour on the hour, prove 10% of it, they would spend the rest of their lives in jail for slander and libel. (laughs) I've never understood how you don't dare say what they say. You couldn't get away with it. You'd be sued. And they are constantly by innuendo and suggestion and lie and everything else. If anyone has listened to the news or read it, biased is a mild word. It's no news. I still have not read anything in the paper about the testimonies that I hear here every week. That doesn't make news, or it's not the kind they're interested in. It makes news. And so you'll never get a good report. They don't come with any intention to present what they don't understand. If they understood it, they wouldn't be reporting it. They couldn't hold their job if they understood it. It's that simple. We know that already. But we do have a responsibility, and somehow we've got to come to the place where what we're saying from the pulpit, which is the position of the church, which I assume you want to follow, or you wouldn't be here. I've never understood anyone that doesn't agree with the basic principles of this church that would continue to come. That doesn't make any sense, so I assume that if you keep coming, I give you the benefit of the doubt that you're an intelligent person, you're not mentally retarded, that you know what you're doing. You're not coerced. No one's made you come up here. So we somehow have to get together in what the principles are that should be followed and what we do when the need arises in the situation, whether it's childbirth or death or sickness or whatever. We need to know what the message of faith really is all about, what it requires in these cases, what our responsibilities are, what the church's position is. With the freedom that a charismatic body has like this, there are problems. Of course, it's not problems of spiritual death, Like you find in the institutional system, it's not boredom being bored to death every Sunday. You'll never mistake the barn for the funeral director's parlor (laughs) or the cemetery. But with the freedom of a charismatic body, as we show you in the book Charismatic Body Ministry, goes responsibility. You must know when you're acting as an individual and when you're acting on behalf of the church and when you have a responsibility as an individual to make sure that your action is in harmony with what the position of the church is. And we believe the position of the church is what the Lord is showing us in these matters. Now let's take the matter of the death of a saint. What should our attitude be? Is it a lack of faith not to pray for a person to be raised from the dead when they've died because we have the end time message of faith and we know that God has and does raise the dead? The message of the New Testament, the faith message of the New Testament does not require that we attempt to raise the dead every time a saint dies. To think so means you do not know 
the message of faith or the New Testament. The raising of the dead in the Bible is an exception. There is a time coming, like in Indonesia, by the way, there have been many raised, there's no question over there by the authorities, it's valid, it's happened too many times. But I want to tell you something, every time a saint dies over there, they don't run out and try to raise him. You see, there's a balance here somewhere that we've got to get across to all of us. And so in the Bible is an exception. Down through church history, people have been raised in the church, but it's an exception. Hebrews 9, 27 tells us it's given unto men once to die. Now let's keep Hebrews 9, 27 along with those confessions that we'll see Jesus return. Some of us know and believe that we will, but that's again a matter of faith. But there have been millions of martyrs that no attempt was ever made to raise them from the dead. All the apostles except John died. They were martyred, actually, in no attempt to raise them from the dead. James was killed. Stephen stoned. Paul was stoned and was killed. That's very obvious from the text there in the book of Acts. But God raised him up. There are instances of raising the dead in the Bible, but dear friends, it is the exception, not the rule, and it's a misunderstanding of the message of faith to think that a person lacks faith if they don't immediately try to raise a child or a loved one or a friend from the dead when they die. That's a misunderstanding to think that's a lack of faith. I say this in the only way I know how, <laughs> and that is the way I'm going to say it. I think I've got as much faith as anybody here. I think I have. Oh, I know I have. In fact, I know I've got more faith than a lot of you. And do you know something? It has never once in 11 charismatic years occurred to me, not once, to ever attempt to raise anybody that I know, whether they're in this body or others that have died around the country that I know from the dead, when I hear they've died. It just has never occurred to me. And I have taught you your faith, most of you. So it isn't a lack of faith. It's an understanding that there's a balance somewhere. And it's not a contradiction to the greater works message that we preached here recently on the book of Romans. That the time is coming when an anointing is coming like Smith Wigglesworth had. But let's wait until we get the anointing of Smith Wigglesworth. He had it. And God is going to give it. So there's several things that are required that we meet our responsibility. As I say, nothing is criticism. There must be an understanding, however, of what our attitude should be. What should you do when a loved one dies? Are you immediately obligated to try to raise from the dead? Should you hold the body hours or days? You see, you've got to know that because I've had people say, well, I just didn't know what to do. And the authorities, you see, after a reasonable length of time. It's not natural childbirth, that's just a smokescreen. It's the idea that on occasion people have kept the body too long, in their opinion, without calling the authorities. Now, dear friends, if it had been faith, they'd be here tonight. So there was no purpose in three hours, four hours, three days, six days, or whatever. That's what I'm saying. And so, let's just face reality. You're listening to a person who has faith yeah. telling you something. So, for America, whether it's raising the dead or what, you must have a personal knowledge that this is going to happen. It's that kind of faith. I laid hands on a woman who had a fused spine in her neck. This is on record. She's testified to it right in this meeting, this church. She may be here tonight, so I have to tell the truth, don't I? <laughs> First time she'd ever been in a charismatic meeting, sat right on the corner of the row. I said, let's believe God tonight for a miracle. Who wants a miracle? Now, I don't do that every night. She had this neck she could not move. She had to move her body, fused from an accident. She said, I do. I told me what it was. I laid my hand on it. I said, thank you, Jesus. And just like that, just free. I didn't ask the body to believe. I just took it on myself. I'm talking about... If you're going to believe for a miracle, you must have the faith for it, or you must have a revelation from heaven that's going to happen. 
And that often comes in vision and so forth. And of course, the faith's going to be there if you have that. You believe in raising the dead? I sure do. That isn't what we're saying. I mean, we're not going to back off for all the channels on television or all the papers in the country, whatever they say. We'll not back off of that one. Oh, we sure do believe it. It's happened right here in this body. Brother told me just recently, he said, we haven't told it yet, but said a certain woman here died and was dead three minutes and was being delivered of the child of a nurse. So she ought to know what death looks like. She's seen it before, dead three minutes. And we kept rebuking that spirit of death and she's here tonight. She's here tonight with her baby. So do we believe in it? Yes. But it was three minutes. It wasn't three days, three hours, three months. See what I'm saying? Well, I'm going to say more about it later because people say, well, how long and all of that. You can't set rules there, but there has to be a balance. Why, when we first became charismatic, a brother right from Ohio, and we had a lot coming from Ohio at that time, when we first became charismatic, and he came back after several weeks uh, after he'd been baptized in the Spirit and told. I've told this before in another message, I believe, how that his sister called him on the phone, said the baby had been missing, about a three-year-old child, two or three-year-old child, and she'd discovered him in the bathroom, had fallen into the wastebasket and fell on his neck and had uh, knocked him out and he had not been breathing. She didn't know how long. He was uh, blue, his eyes glazed and dead for all practical purposes. said, every now and then, give a little gasp like that and called him and he said I rushed over there now this is faith isn't going to try something he said I knew I had to get my hands on the baby because I knew as soon as I touched him that the spirit would be restored so they had him in the back seat of the car getting ready to rush him to the hospital said to pick the baby up and said the blood of Jesus said as soon as I did he sat up coughed perfectly normal now, I don't know <laughs> what medical science would say about that or how they would analyze it. They didn't get in the papers, by the way. Yeah. Never will. Because they'd say, well, you just thought. No, we believe in raising the dead, but we believe there's a right way. I'm saying, friends, somewhere yeah. Yeah. we've got to see what the faith message is all about. If you've got the faith for it, it's going to happen if the other conditions are met. There are other conditions, aren't there? Well, that's something else we need to know because what if a person has died due to chastisement? You don't always know that. Well, you can just pray and claim and fast all you want and they're not going to be raised. David tried that. He had an illegitimate child, remember, by Bathsheba. And he prayed and God said no. The Lord allowed the child to die. And we know of a case where prayed for a child for three days and then learned it was illegitimate. Well, if I'd known that to begin with, I could have told them, you're wasting your time. I could have cited them David's case. So I'm saying, dear friends, there are conditions to be met, either by the individual before they die or the people after they die. I've been called not only from here, I've been called from here, but I've been called from other places on the phone. We're believing for such and such a person to be raised from the dead. They've died We've been holding on for a day or two. Now, if God shows you anything, why don't you hesitate to call us? You know, even collect. Call, collect. If God shows me anything, I'll tell you what I'll tell people to do. He isn't going to show me anything. That isn't faith. That's a condition they're missing. Oh, if it's faith, friends, you don't have to call on anyone. Well, maybe he wants to use you. No, he doesn't want to use me. If he does, he'd have told me. That isn't faith. And you see, it never happens, so it proves it isn't faith. Faith never asks a question. It always says, I'm going to take all the responsibility. Faith is not just taking an action. I've prayed for people who've walked an aisle. They never get healed. They took action. They acted. But faith is putting the action and faith together. Another thing we have to keep in mind, we've stressed this in this church many times, there's something greater than your faith and my faith something greater that's the will of God if you'd look at 1st John 5 14 and 15 I know we can quote it I do all the time but I'd like for you to see it because this is going to help you understand some things that you can not understand outside any other passage of Scripture except 1st John 5 14 and 15 
that there's something greater than our faith, and that is the will of God. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. Now, anyone who can understand the meaning of words knows precisely that what he said there was we can have confidence that if we ask anything, not something, no exceptions here, anything if it's according to his will. See, that limits that anything, doesn't it? According to his will, we know we already have the petition that we ask. And so we must have the confidence that we're praying in the will of God. We have stressed over and over in this body that Matthew 21, 22 must go with 1 John 5. Matthew 21, 22, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. But you've got to take that with what he said here. You must put the two together, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer according to his will believing, you receive. Yeah. Now, I can't take the responsibility for knowing the Word of God for anyone else. I can only answer for myself. There are no shortcuts. That's why we labor in the Word to get you into a deeper understanding of the Word of God because there's how you will know His will, basically, through His Word. In a message, I believe I said once, that Jesus never attempted to use faith contrary to the will of God just to prove that he was son of God or to work a miracle. Yeah. He would never do that. He would never try to use his faith out of harmony with the will of God. There are times he could have proven his claims. Just give us a sign, show us. And he knew that wasn't the will of God because the will of God is they're going to have to believe your word, not the signs. The signs confirm the word. But if you get the sign first, have to have the sign first. Then as he said in Luke 16, you wouldn't believe if one rose from the dead if you don't believe the word already. And so we must know what the will of God is in the matter. And raising the dead, friends, God does it, but it's the exception. And when it happens, it happens. That's all I can tell you. That you are not under some obligation every time somebody dies in the church, and we're not anticipating anybody dying, Amen. to feel you have to do something, except what we will show you a little later is a normal procedure for a charismatic, Bible-believing Christian. But take Smith Wigglesworth and his wife. Now, Smith Wigglesworth was somewhere preaching, and someone said, your wife just dropped dead. I think she was preaching. She was a preacher, too. Your wife just dropped dead. And he rushed from wherever he was and ran over there and rebuked the spirit of death. Now, he had the apostolic anointing that's going to come on overcomers, and she just raised right up. Amen. That's fine. Praise the Lord. He saw a lot of people die. He didn't do that. But he wanted his wife back. And God, I'm saying something's bigger than your faith or Smith Wigglesworth's faith. And that's the will of God. And God spoke in an audible voice and said, Smith, turn her loose. Her ministry's finished. I'm taking her home. But you notice his faith kept her there. He has said in his word he would honor faith. And so he had to ask Smith to turn her loose. That's tremendous. Well, you have to get in that position before God will deal with you that way. Don't ever presume that God will deal with you like he dealt with Moses. Moses could stand in the gap 40 days when God said, get out of the way. It's not my will. Moses said, you have to take me first. That pleased God. But see, Moses was on believing ground. Moses was not presumptuous. Moses could do that. And some of you are not ready to presume on God. He'll just blast you out of the way to get this one. <laughs> you got to pay the cost to get where Moses did, or Smith did. And so the significant thing is there was something bigger than Smith's faith. That was God's will. Oh, certainly had to turn her loose. His faith wasn't bigger than God's will, but his faith could bring her to life but couldn't hold her if it wasn't God's will for that. I remember a brother telling that he was getting ready to pray for somebody that he knew in the hospital, and the Lord spoke to him directly and said, don't pray for his healing. I'm taking him home. He just happens to be in fellowship. He never is in fellowship, but a few weeks at a time. He's in fellowship now, and I'm taking him. 
don't pray for him. Because, you know, if he gets healed, he'll be back out on his bottle again or something. So, we must know the Word of God because our faith can't rise above the level of what the Word of God teaches. That is what we know about the Word of God. And whatever answer you think God has given you, I'll tell you the way that you can know if it's God. It'll be in perfect harmony with His Word. He never will tell you anything, reveal anything to you that's out of harmony with His Word. Faith is merely acting out what God has already said He would do in the Word. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, we read, now let's take 16 with it. For if any man see his brother, remember he said we could ask for anything according to his will. So if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. He can pray for that and it shall be given life for them that sin not unto death. But there is a sin unto death and I do not say that he shall pray for it. In other words, the force of the Greek is he's not to pray for that. He's not to pray for that because there's a sin unto death that you can't pray for. Yeah. Why? Well, he just told you there's something bigger than your faith. That's my will. And he says, you can ask in faith for the life of a person who sins that's uh, not unto death and I'll answer your prayer. God promises that. That's beautiful. But he said, there's just a sin that you can't pray for. Now that's on a tape what the unpardonable sin is and the sin unto death and the Hebrews 6 apostasy and so forth. But for our purpose, we're showing you there's something bigger than your faith. Now, another thing to keep in mind, if you have the faith for a miracle, or if you claim to have a revelation for a miracle, whatever kind of miracle, raising the dead, is no greater miracle than any other kind of miracle, because God works the miracles. So we're talking about a principle, not just raising the dead, but if you have the faith for it, then with your faith goes all the responsibility for it happening. Now that's a big order, friends. It's one thing to come and sit under the faith teaching and then attempt and try to do some things. But what principle we must grasp and keep repeating to ourselves that if we're going to believe for something, then we must be willing to accept the responsibility for its happening. That's true of healing or finances. Don't testify or say I've claimed finances and then expect us to give it to you. <laughs> with your faith or the salvation of loved one, whatever, with your faith goes the responsibility for it happening. When I told this morning about God healing my daughter's arm, I didn't ask anyone else to believe for me or even with me. When we learned I was 180 miles away speaking at a full gospel meeting and learned that they had had this bad accident and we couldn't get all the information on the phone but we knew that her arm was in bad shape and she was suffering we got the word over the phone a contusion and other things we didn't know about the other two my wife and i went right out in the alley beside the restaurant where we were meeting to speak and uh, agreed together matthew 18 19 says we tell others it works let's believe it for ourselves went back in. They already knew the news before we'd arrived. They were sitting there like owls on a limb, big eyes. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? <laughs> well, he's going to do what everyone else does. They thought, rush back to the hospital. I said, now, we practice what we preach. I'm here to teach on faith. We've already agreed she's healed. They're healed, all three. Now, we don't want you to believe for us, but stand with us and praise God that it's done. I didn't ask them to believe for me, not even with me. It, I wouldn't criticize if you said believe with me to somebody. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying even then you've got to take the responsibility. And of course it did happen, as we all know. When I closed my business in 52 with five people in the family and went off to college and I've never regretted it and took Matthew 6.33 for my supply of all of my needs, I had to act. I told people it would work. I told people I wouldn't go bankrupt or starve to death. That was my faith. I could never ask anybody to believe for me or to stand with me. I'm talking about when it's faith, dear friends, we're going to have to believe for ourselves. Matthew 18, 19, the prayer of agreement has a place, but you shouldn't go through life having to agree with people. And you never get into agreeing with miracles anyway because if you've got the faith for it, it's going to happen. I'm saying in all this you shouldn't involve others in your faith responsibility unless they want to get involved. 
It's all right for somebody to say, well, I'm believing with you. But if you have to ask them, then that's not faith. And with respect to the church here, you should never imply by what you say to others, authorities or people you're witnessing to, and you don't have to tell the news media anything. So say if you do, you've already heard us say that you're just asking for trouble for the body and yourself. But whatever you say, you should never involve the church in it. See, that's an easy out. The church taught me this. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that the church couldn't be mentioned. That is what I'm saying. But we don't need any more help. <laughs> we don't need any more misunderstanding. Stand on your own two feet of faith. Right. Don't say, this is what the preacher up there preaches, or this is what they taught me. Say, this is what I believe. That's right. This is my decision. Yeah. This is the way I acted my faith. I believed God would heal or supply the need or raise the dead or whatever. I'm not telling you not to believe for the raising of the dead. I'm saying that we've got to learn the difference between faith and leaning on someone else. And when it is faith and what would constitute faith in this hour and what wouldn't. So the church's position is this that the New Testament, we believe, does not teach that the raising of the saints is an obligation every time one dies. And that if you don't do it, it proves you don't have any faith. We believe that the New Testament does not require the raising of the saints as they die to prove that you have faith. If you believe you have faith, if you believe you have faith, we encourage you. We say, be it unto you according to your faith. We'll tell that to the authorities, anybody that needs to hear it. Amen. But you see, that's your responsibility. We're going to say, we said to him, to her, be it unto thee according to your faith. But it is your faith, and you've got to accept the responsibility for it happening. Don't ever call the pastor or someone in the church when it didn't work and say, what should I do? because we've already told you. It's on the tape. If it's faith, it's your responsibility. And don't say this is what the church teaches because we just have to undo that and hand tapes out to the authorities to show the church's position. Amen. That we teach faith. We teach people to believe for the impossible. But we teach faith. The New Testament doesn't require, dear friends, am I getting through to you, for you to think you have to raise every saint who dies. The New Testament didn't do it. Church history, they didn't do it. Now, what we didn't say is that you should not rebuke a spirit of death if you're present when it tries to take over. We didn't say that. Well, how long should I? I don't know. I don't know how long, but I'm going to tell you, if it's an hour or two or three, it's probably too long. You say, well, now, I know people that waited three days or a woman 13 hours. Praise God. But they got raised. I know of a woman claimed her husband, believed for 27 years, and he died on her. Unsaved. She wouldn't let him take the body. God's word is true. He's dead and he's not saved. She held on one hour, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I don't care what the news media thinks about something like that. Thirteenth hour, he opened his eyes and said, I died. He says, Take me home, dear. She says, Not on your life, not until you give your heart to Jesus. <laughs> and he did and she did and went back to railroading. Railroaded for years. Now that's on record. I've still got it in my files, I'm sure. If anybody wants to read the report? Oh, yes, we believe. But you see, he's alive, or he was. I mean, he may have died again by now, but the point is that uh, we're not talking about setting time limits. I don't know how long. I know this case that was reported to me recently was three minutes. I know the case I just told you about, the baby had been that way, I don't know how long, but as soon as he touched the baby, it came to life. Amen. I'm saying that if it were me, 
I'd give a reasonable length of time, and if the spirit hasn't come back into the body in a reasonable length of time, I'm not even saying you're obligated to pray for the spirit to come back to the body. A woman 87 years old, your mother, lying there in quiet peace, bring her back to die again? I don't think you're obligated to do that. <laughs> I think a reasonable amount of time and don't say he said an hour or two hours or what <laughs> you see you're there in the situation you know yeah. and you know whether it's faith one brother said to me I didn't have the faith for it so why take all day yeah. I said I didn't have the faith for it I did what I thought I should do well then what should you do because the state requires you make a report then you better call the people who are in charge don't call the pastor first or the associate pastor first or somebody in the body first because under normal circumstances you could die anywhere in Warsaw fall dead on the street and you could do that but I'll tell you friends we've been through some things here so you make sure you contact this is just a principle hypothetical but after all let's face reality I didn't expect anybody to die yet and they have then you get in touch with the authorities. The first thing I heard about the last case was he didn't call the authorities, he called somebody in the church. You see, they're looking for something to criticize. Because, as I say, under normal circumstances, you could reverse that or do it any way you want within reason. But friends, there's something about faith assembly that the devil, every time he hears it, he just climbs the wall. <laughs> So I'm saying, be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Use a little wisdom. And of course, people have said, well, I didn't know what to do. Well, now you know what to do. Let the Spirit guide you. A doctor will work over a deceased for a few minutes. They ought to give us that right. I don't think there's a law that could keep you from doing that. You say, well, I know of a case where it was three days later. Well, as I said, it was three days later, and they're with us. We're not talking about where faith is present. We're talking about where we're trying to raise the dead. You don't try to raise the dead. So now, is that clear? That could not offend anybody unless there's something the matter with them. That you are under no obligation. If the Spirit of God does not lead you to pray for a dead loved one, don't you start doing it. It won't work. And if you want to, that is your perfect right and privilege. I tell you, just get to rebuking that spirit of death. Because not, it's not unusual for death to give up its victim. But dear friends, you have to use a little bit of common sense. If it's faith, it's not going to be hours and days. And those exceptions where it was, as I say, the people are with us. So there's no problem with that. That'll never make the papers either. That man dead 13 hours, that never made the papers. Because nobody believes that. He just looked, he was uh, in a coma. He was in a state of suspended animation or whatever it is that they have terms for to explain away a miracle. No one's going to believe you. Go ahead and try to get them to believe a miracle. We've had so many miracles here of every nature that the news media wouldn't be able to report the election if they just started reporting about a tenth of them. But they're not going to do it. Now, as we said a few words about the home deliveries, <laughs> as we mentioned last time, milkman used to deliver the milk, and we called it home deliveries. So there's so many babies delivered at home, <laughs> but we personally have no position. So that's why we want to reemphasize the faith principles for having a baby by natural methods is the same as the faith principles we've already given you for miracles or healing or anything else. The church does not criticize people who have natural childbirth anymore and they're going to criticize anybody who has it some other way. We're going to say the natural way is the natural way. <laughs> but uh, I could say that downstairs as well as in the pulpit. 
because that's just the way it was until people today have submitted to the easy method of taking the baby. But whether you have it delivered by someone that is in the body or out of the body, that is the local body, is your choice, your decision. But as I suggested before, I suggest you get someone that knows what they're doing. If I take my car to the garage, I don't want some youthful mechanic experimenting on the motor and says, I've got faith. <laughs> I don't know anything about it, but I'm going to practice on your motor. <laughs> if I was a woman, I wouldn't want childbirth by that method. But the position of the church all along has been that we cannot legislate on a normal function of the human race having babies. And neither can any of you, any of you, legislate for the church. And that's where some, I think, uh, occasionally have tried to do. They have felt, well, it has to be their way or it isn't right. Your way may be the best, but you cannot, as we've said before, force anyone, any woman, into having a baby your way on your terms. Because if they don't have the faith for it, then we're going to be in the papers again. As likely as not. This is a thing for the individual. So what is our position? We've had people come, you know, who's going to deliver my baby? I'm from Ohio or New York or somewhere. Somehow word has gotten out that faith assembly is where you come to have your baby or find out about natural childbirth. So our position is clear on the tapes and the church in the New Testament is not called to get involved in social functions, but to preach the gospel. There is no ministry in the body of Christ of the deliverance of babies. There is a deliverance ministry, but it's not of babies. It's not a ministry, as I said before, any more than it's a ministry for a farmer to deliver a calf or lambs. It's not a ministry for you to teach your child to read. These are normal functions and so forth. We've appointed no women in the church to deliver babies. We want to go on record again and say there is no one with this ministry in the body. If you want to have a baby by natural means and there happens to be someone in the body that knows how to be a midwife and you and she want to get together and both have faith for it, then that's between you two and the Lord. We're not in the birthing business. I don't find any place in the Bible where the churches get involved in that or have a position on it. The principle is faith. It would have to be faith if you want the old route in the hospital. It would still take faith, so that's not anything new. No, we don't recommend you go to the hospital to have a baby. We don't recommend. That's what we're trying to get across to you. The only thing I've ever said, and you can't legislate, is that if I were going to have the baby, I'd want a midwife who knew what she was doing. Amen. I don't want her experimenting on me. I don't want her to learn midwife. You say, how are we going to learn if we don't? I don't know. That's not my problem. <laughs> I mean that. Christians have surrendered their rights and privileges to medical science, and we're just going to have to pay the cost to get back the natural way. There's no other way to see it, dear friends. But we can't legislate. I don't use seatbelts, but I can't legislate to you on that. I don't have any insurance, but I can't tell you, you must go home and cancel yours. You'd probably lose your car or house. But if you come and testify that you've got assurance and don't need insurance, I'll say, praise the Lord. You know, the Lord showed me that too several years ago. Amen. I'm going to give you my testimony, but I can't legislate. But there is a responsibility that we act responsibly. Amen. Look to the Lord. We haven't set forth any rules or precepts tonight that you have to follow. But somewhere there's a balance between what's being said we believe and do, putting dead babies on the altar up here and praying for them. I wonder what night it was that that reporter saw that. You see, they don't have to be responsible for what they say. If we followed those methods, that person would be sued for libel and everything else. When were they here that they saw that? They couldn't prove that. Yeah, where's the altar? 
<laughs> and all of those other weird things that get reported. Oh, I've read the articles, friends. They report it the way they want it to sound to their hearers. You see, they write to the kind of people that likes to read the negative and the repulsive and the degrading and that which will cause one to be oppressed and depressed and all. They're writing to those kind of people so you can't write of the good things that happen. And so know that you have a responsibility to the body. That's no criticism to anyone because they say some people, they said, I didn't know what to do. So I called this brother, that brother, and by that time, two, three, four hours has passed and the authorities say, why do you wait so late? Because if you call me, I'm going to do what I always do. When people have, I say the first thing to them, call the authorities. I don't say I'm going to come over and pray for that person to be raised. I say, when I find out, I talked to one brother, didn't even know his wife's dead. As soon as I found out, I said, well, immediately go call the authorities. That's the way. Because if they're going to be raised, you've already raised them and you're here testifying about it. If they've not, then don't give the enemy any cause for putting any more stigma on the body of Christ than it's needed. And when new people come into the body, please get a tape like this in their hands so they know this is the one place where we've been criticized unnecessarily sometimes. That's all we're saying. Criticism, oh, you thrive on that. I cut my spiritual teeth on criticism. I just praise God for it. We've got no problems there. It's just let's don't give them any cause and understand the position of the church. I think we can all go along with that because people who can't are not going to be here very long anyway. The following is an admonition recorded at an earlier date, but was added to this tape by request of Brother Freeman. I want to deal with a very serious matter concerning the recurring problem with regard to natural childbirth. I'd just like to read one passage before I say some things about this. Eventually I knew I would have to deal with it again. We've got a tape on it, but constantly we're getting questions and problems are arising. 2 Timothy 4, 1-2. Now this doesn't have anything to do with bearing children, but it does have something to do with my position in dealing with it the way I think I should. 2 Timothy 4. I charge thee therefore before God the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine, our teaching. If the pastor has a responsibility to exhort, he exhorts, to rebuke, he rebukes with all longsuffering and doctrine. And no one can ever accuse of us of being lax at that point. But there is this recurring problem concerning natural childbirth. I uh, set down a few things here concerning questions and all I've gotten. And I want to share those with you and then come to some conclusions. We get letters, phone calls. Everywhere we go, people are raising questions about natural childbirth as if you know, that this is our calling up here. <laughs> it's amazing the people that somehow think that we've got a book out on it that we can mail them are a ministry here dealing with delivering children. I mean, just constantly questions, letters, phone calls over the past, well, two years at least or more. We've got people, women coming from other states to have someone in the barn deliver their babies. Now these are just some of the things I'm going to lay out to see that uh, generally we don't bring anything to you because, you know, we've said capable leadership is supposed to handle it and you don't have to call a business meeting to have a vote on whether or not to obey God. <laughs> but since this affects the whole church and constantly is uh, a problem, problems being raised. 
like women coming from other states to have their babies delivered by someone in the barn. They think, you know, we have a ministry of that. <laughs> then here are people like a woman presently with a kidney infection that was going to have natural childbirth through a doctor, but she has developed an infection and is willing to believe God by faith for the healing and manifestation of that. But you know what his reaction is, is to, well, he said, if you won't take medicine, I won't deliver your child. Well, you come up, you know, to the last few weeks, and that's kind of a, a blow. Well, then, because we're supposed to be in this, quote, ministry, unquote, we get the problem. What to do? And now this is not an isolated thing. It's happening all the time, questions and problems. Then, again, there's division in this body of all things over this. You see, the enemy will always work at the weakest point in the link, the weakest link in the chain, the weakest point. And uh, God has preserved us from disharmony and confusion, but we're having a lot of it here at this point. In this way, some believe it's all right to attend child-bearing classes to learn how, you know, to learn the exercises and the proper breathing methods and so forth. Then there'll be others who will say using any method is not faith and will be critical of those who even learn how to breathe properly. I mean criticism in the body. There are others, these things keep coming to me, who find that they can never be sure who's going to act as a midwife. They may think they know, and then at the last minute discover that somebody didn't get a revelation they were supposed to deliver that child. So even deliverance has become uh, by revelation. And if I'm supposed to deliver your baby, someone says, then the Lord will show me. Uh, I fail to find this sort of midwifery in the Bible. Some come to me because they're concerned about the methods or ways that it's done. Now, we are purposely avoiding trying to pinpoint anything definite enough that anyone would be embarrassed. But at the same time, this is the last time we're going to deal with it. We're going to make it so plain that uh, everybody understands. Amen. That has to be because the devil is using this to cause some disarmament in the body. But some are concerned. They come to me in private and say, I'm not criticizing such and such a sister, but there are things here I question that does, does not seem to be scriptural or based on the word. And some come to believe, have come to believe, that midwifery is a ministry and a calling. Or others have come to me, my husband doesn't agree with this with natural childbirth. What do I do? I've got the faith. You see, all sorts of problems and questions being raised. And so what we want to do, we want to make a final statement on the question. And the first thing in a final statement is this, that the church's position is clear. We have covered it thoroughly. It's on a tape. This is going to be added to that tape, what we're saying tonight. That's the first thing. Our position is clear here. If you have any questions, it's on a tape. I tell people that. Again, the church's calling in the New Testament is not to provide social services, but to preach the word. Amen. Now, we can't overemphasize that. There is no ministry in the church of the New Testament called delivering babies. That is not a ministry. That is not a calling. That's as normal and natural as it has been since the Garden of Eden, and billions have been birthed into the world, and no one thought it was a ministry in the church. I fail to find anywhere in the New Testament even suggesting that's a ministry any more than teaching your child how to read is a ministry. Our farmer delivering the lambs in springtime is a ministry. Our burying the dead is a ministry. These are just natural things that, that we do, whether we're in the church or out of the church, or even saved or unsaved. Again, we want to say that we have appointed no women in the church to such an office. Now that we firmly state. We have appointed no women in the church to such an office. Those who have helped in delivering children have taken this on themselves. Amen. That isn't a critical statement, but 
know that those who have taken upon themselves to deliver children of wives in the church have taken that on themselves, and if they have related it to some minister or calling, they have done that. The church hasn't encouraged it. I don't say they have, but uh, we, we are hearing it, that it's a ministry and a calling. And so we want to go on record that if anyone is calling it a ministry or calling, we're telling you it is not scriptural. You should not use those terms. We want to go on record as the church, this local body, that there's no such ministry in the body of Christ, that no one here has been appointed to deliver babies. And if you know of someone in or out of the local body who can deliver babies, act as a midwife, who has faith with you for natural childbirth, then that is strictly a private matter between you and that individual and God. The church is not even involved. Amen. Amen. There can be no official midwives in the church because there's not in the New Testament. Don't do as we constantly ask, who is the midwife or the midwives in the church? We don't have any. We don't have a one. And if you see that, then the whole problem's resolved. Don't come asking leadership, who can deliver my baby? I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. <laughs> and this whole deliverance ministry was started by those who are doing the delivering. And again, that isn't a critical statement. That's a fact. But it, there's so much confusion that has to be laid out so everyone understands it because... People keep saying, well, why don't you say something then? And I always say there's a time to say. And uh, eventually when you get enough complaints and criticism and confusion, then you deal with it. Now then, since the devil is using this to cause confusion, division in this body, then as pastor and on behalf of the church, here are six things that I want to say in love but precisely that the church's position is on the tape. If anyone asks questions, have them hear the tape. In addition to what we'll add to it, unless this will be a separate tape or a second tape, then it'll be tapes. But the church's position is on the tape. We haven't changed our position. I hope you're all listening. Secondly, there is to be no more criticism of how women are to have their babies because they're not doing it your way. There's to be no more. I mean, it's to stop, period, finish, done, over with, past tense, history. And we plainly point out on the tape not to criticize because if a woman does not yet have the faith you've got, you can't force her into having a natural childbirth if the enemy moves in there with any sort of opposition, then where is she? And uh, you don't deliver babies just by faith, regardless of what some may think, any more than you say to your child in the crib, change your diaper. You can if you believe it. <laughs> or, <laughs> or, I'm not trying to be funny, but it, it, it sometimes good to laugh at yourselves, but any more you say to a child, teach yourself to read. Well, he says, I will if you give me some help here. Why, God doesn't feed you. You bend your elbow. It's not a lack of faith to know what position to lie in when that baby's coming forth. I'm sure the Israelite midwives uh, told them not to stand on their head or do something foolish. <laughs> I don't recommend you go to classes and learn uh, the ways of the world with their mental suggestion and uh, things akin to hypnosis and all of this business. I don't, I don't believe that that's scriptural either. Thirdly, there is to be no unscriptural designation of deliverance of babies as a ministry or calling in this church. See, all over the country, people are inquiring and they're confused sometimes uh, themselves and what can you answer them 
So there's to be no more speaking in this body of it being a ministry. Now, I assume those who've done that have done it just in ignorance, and uh, we're following 2 Timothy 4 and admonishing you. Fourthly, there's to be no criticism of this church's position on this as a lack of faith. Now, I've heard that. Well, my brother Freeman, you know, uh, he just, if he just knew more, and it's not faith for a person to know how to breathe right when that baby's coming forth. Listen, dear friends, my daughter, I got my education at her bedside. Again, that's no criticism, but she wore herself out with wrong instruction. And if she'd had proper instruction, it had nothing to do with faith. And I was heard someone told her she didn't have faith, you see. And so uh, this isn't the way to do it. No criticism of the church's position is a lack of faith. Dear, dear midwife, whoever you are, the whole church, whatever you know about faith, you probably got here. Uh, just, just be a little realistic. All the pastor, you know, the pastor can still teach you a whole lot about faith. Things he hasn't even brought forth yet until you're ready for it. And this is a delusion on your part if you think what we've said tonight is a lack of faith. I want to say that's a deceiving spirit because you don't apply that in the other areas of your life. You teach your child to feed himself and to read and you help him when he can't help himself. That, that, isn't, that is not biblical faith to talk that way. All you have to do is believe. You see, faith and action go together. Remember, James 2. Fifthly, there's to be no official church literature or classes on childbearing. We don't have a position on childbearing or feeding the poor, setting up kitchens or other social activities. Everybody, as a Christian, individually should help where he could. But see, the social gospel and where the church has got itself into trouble is this very thing. It starts out with uh, feeding and uh, delivering babies and political reform and helping in this and that. And the first thing you know, it's no longer preaching the word. We don't want to be known here as the uh, body that delivers babies by natural childbirth. So there should be no official literature or classes on teaching. Now we don't mean by that that those who have knowledge in midwifery, when they're asked by the one who's interested in childbirth, they're going to just tell them all you know. That isn't what we're saying. We're not saying not to have your child by natural childbirth. But all of that is on the tape. That is a question of faith between you and the Lord. The church has no position on it except for you to follow the word of God and no one can lay out rules for that. And finally, and we say this in deep love, but we have to say it because it's the second time we've had to say this, that if you feel you can't conform and keep from criticizing as this position being a lack of faith, then you'll have to practice your midwifery somewhere else. Now that's, we have to say that. If you feel that's a calling, and it isn't, but if you feel it is, you'll have to practice that calling somewhere else. Because the enemy is using this to uh, interfere and destroy the effect effectiveness of this body. And if God has called us to be anything, it's to be watchmen, watching, and you don't always deal with questions and problems when they arise. You pray about them, you uh, take certain steps, but eventually, when the whole body gets involved and confusion seems to reign, then we have to deal with it. Now, friends, understand, we're not going to say any more about it. If anyone else, if there's any problem, I'm going to come directly to you as pastor and use my authority that the Lord has given me. Now, it's that serious. When people call, what, uh, is there anyone there to deliver babies? Say, no, that isn't our business. But if there's anybody in the body that has knowledge of that and you want to help someone birth a child, that's fine. We're all for it. We believe in natural childbirth. That's the way it is in the Bible. That isn't what we're saying. In fact, anyone who's been listening knows that isn't what we're saying. 
And I say that is no criticism of any individual, but there are individuals involved because people have come to me about individuals involved. And so those who are involved are the ones, first of all, I'm talking to, but we're talking to the whole body. Let it be a matter between you and God. No, uh, faith and uh, help is not the way, but faith and using common knowledge uh, is not uh, 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 contradicted in the Bible. That common sense should dictate in anything you do. If there's a way properly to have a breech birth, and there's a way that breech births can be delivered, then it's good to know that. Yeah. That you don't stand in a corner, you may squat, you know, that sort of thing. There are ways. So it's good to have that knowledge. That has nothing to do with faith. I mean, I can't stand out in, in front of the, the traffic and uh, say, I've got faith, nothing will hit me. God expects me to use a little common sense to get my legs into locomotion and to do something. <laughs> And sometimes it's good to know now's the time to run, don't walk. <laughs> That's right. There is no contradiction between faith and knowledge is what we're saying. Uh, there might have been some easier times sometimes if a little knowledge was present, a little more knowledge. Now that is it, friends. We're not going to bring it before you anymore. Uh, uh, there's no midwifery in the church. If a few have that knowledge and want to help women birth babies, fine. I think a woman should claim that to have natural childbirth, painless childbirth, easy childbirth as a part of her deliverance from the curse, and that God would provide her with someone to help her to act as midwife. See, this is an art that is lost, and we should not be practicing learning it uh, at the expense of others. Uh, if you know what you're doing, then that's, that's another matter. But remember, faith is included. It's not just knowledge, it's faith. But it's not faith without knowledge, because that isn't Bible. That's a deception. All right. God bless you, and praise the Lord.